Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to session two of uh, Panorama Plus Six, and we are in the kingship united monarchy. And honestly, we are in the section of the scripture that you may have read in the past, but I dare say most people don't study uh, biblical history. <clears throat> so it's unique history, as we pointed out last time, in that it is theologically driven. It is not a uh, uh, historical event or chronologically driven. In other words, the biblical writer wants you to know what happened. That's important. And that it really happened. But he'll give you a little bit of theological insight as to uh, why it happened and what we learned from it and so forth. So we are in the story <clears throat> beginning with uh, Eli, the old uh, priest and judge, uh, who will mentor young Samuel, who will be a prophet, a priest, and a judge, who will then anoint the first king of that united empire, Saul, uh, and he will anoint the second king, David. He will not anoint uh, his son Solomon. He'll be passed on by then. But, uh, uh, but the third king of the united empire is the son of Solomon, or one of the, son, or one of the sons of David, uh, Solomon. So that's kind of the panorama united kingship. Not very many kings, <clears throat> but they cast a large shadow over the scriptures. In this study, towards the end, we'll look at some, uh, we'll survey some of the writings uh, of these key characters. David wrote about half of the Psalms, for sure, if, if not more. Uh, Solomon <clears throat> may have written uh, not only uh, Song of Solomon, maybe in his youth, uh, uh, he also wrote many, many proverbs, probably in his middle age years, and at the end of his life uh, is ascribed the writing of Ecclesiastes. So you have him in three developmental stages of his life, you know, the flowering of love and so forth, but there's also some theological meaning behind that. And then there's the wisdom age, and then, of course, at the end of life, Solomon writes Ecclesiastes a book that can be described as been there, done that. Uh, and you actually have to wade through almost uh, 11 and a half chapters of uh, Solomon's <clears throat> aged, uh, sad perspective on life that he has lived, saying, I've tried everything and nothing was satisfying, to finally get to the point of the writing, which is uh, fear God and obey him which also happens to be a subtext in our kings as well. Uh, fear God and obey him, you'll have success. For the people of Israel, fear God and obey him, you'll have success. <clears throat> but if you launch out on your own, uh, you will be disciplined by the Lord. So let's begin, <clears throat> if we can, <clears throat> page 31. And uh, we'll zip through a few of these pages and then we'll spend more time on some of the biblical text. I, gave it, I have given you, <clears throat> again, both Movement 5, Apostasy, and Movement 6, the one we're studying, uh, the timelines, and very simple timelines, those five key characters plus the important date of 931 B.C. That's the death of Solomon. Everything changes with the death of Solomon as we will see in the next uh, movement. <clears throat> next page. I've listed the prominent persons. Uh, you might want to star, since we're studying him today, Saul uh, in this chart, and note again what tribe is Saul from. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. <clears throat> now let's think back. Jacob had 12 sons. Uh, which of his 12 sons should have been the son to receive a double portion. Should have been by custom. Reuben, the first. Reuben's bypassed. He forfeits it along with Simeon, along with Levi, even Judah. Uh, and uh, the favored son was the son of his favorite wife, Rachel, and that's Joseph. And who was Joseph's younger brother uh, who was born as his mother, Rachel, died? It's Benjamin. And so you've got a tribe that has some promise to it in the historical sense that he is, this is a tribe descended from the favored wife 
uh, but of Rachel. But uh, as we will see in biblical history, God sovereignly chooses whomever he wishes. And, and whom he chooses, he uses. And so consequently, even though he's from the tribe of Benjamin, we will see later <clears throat> that will not be the uh, kingly uh, the tribe. Now, we will also see today that Samuel will tell Saul that if you had trusted God and obeyed him, God would have established your dynasty, the Saulite dynasty, and perhaps we would have had a not a Davidic covenant, but a Saulite covenant, because God can choose whom he desires. But in fact, Saul uh, was disobedient and uh, lost his privileged position, and it was given to someone who was more noble, and that is, or the biblical text says, a person after God's own heart, which would be King David. So, at any rate, here's just kind of summarizing up a little bit on this, on these tribes. <clears throat> Notice the uh, important <clears throat> diagram at the bottom. We are in this phase where <clears throat> the time of the judges, where, whereby we have a theocracy, God rules through a chosen administrator, like Adam, like Noah, like Abraham, like Moses. Uh, we, we have a transitional person, Samuel, who will then introduce us to the kingship, and that's a kingship called a theomonarchy. Remember, theomonarchy is different from a monarchy. It's also a little bit subtly different from a theocracy. A theomonarchy is that God rules through the chosen king, who then rules the people under God's ultimate kingship. Uh, later kings in history, many of our European kings, would rule by divine right that God gave us the authority to rule our nations. And the fact of the matter is they ruled the way they wanted to, with, very, with no thought of divine rights. Uh, they just ruled as they pleased. Theomonarchy was so closely related that later in the biblical history, uh, there will be an incumbent upon all kings was knowledge of the law, knowledge of the Mosaic law, and adherence to it, on behalf of the people and their welfare and their well-being. <clears throat> so the kings were supposed to be very uh, intently aware of the regulations of the Mosaic law. They were to ensure that that was practiced in the nation. And when they didn't do their job very well, God would send a prophet, and the prophet would try to correct the king and or correct the people and get them back on the, the way of the law. The law was the means not by which Israel was saved. That would be a work salvation. The law was the means by which Israel could be blessed. If they obeyed the law, they would be blessed. If they disobeyed the law, they would be, biblical terminology, cursed. Or we would say today, disciplined. <coughs> Heavily disciplined. Taken to the woodshed. Uh, it would be the idea. Let's turn the page. The chart at the top, well, let's just, let, let me just ooh for a moment over my wonderful chart. This is the uh, chart of the book 1 Samuel. <clears throat> and notice how it weaves uh, in, in the key personalities. We start out with Eli, <clears throat> who's evil. Uh, when I say evil, he's, uh, <clears throat> he's weak. And uh, he doesn't do a good job of judging or leading or as a high priest. He doesn't do a good job of parenting. But Eli <clears throat> is a failure. Let's be a better word. Eli is going to be a failure, but he will mentor Samuel. Next line down. Then we come back to Samuel, who will anoint Saul as the first king. Then we drop down to the next line. Saul will then be uh, in conflict with David. And we'll see a bit of that today. All right? That's where we are. Uh, also, later you can read those seven distinctive features of 1 Samuel uh, somewhere, I think in the basic panorama class. Uh, I take 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 2 Kings, and I think I do seven distinctive traits of each of those books. So that's just FYI. <clears throat> now, as we begin at the bottom of page 33, some uh, teachers, scholars, have suggested that Israel should never <clears throat> have expected a king, that God was their king. And, and it is true that in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah says, my eyes have seen the king, the Lord Almighty. It is true that the Lord says, I'm the Lord, the Holy One, Israel's creator, your king. 
God is the ultimate sovereign of the universe. That is something that uh, man has a hard time taking to heart. <clears throat> we are not the masters of our fate and the captains of our souls. We are dependent creatures, dependent fully and completely upon the grace and the mercy of God who uh, created us and we are not necessary beings, we are contingent beings. We have to have certain things in order to live and have life. God lives and exists in and of, of himself. And so consequently, he is, by the rights of creator, he is the ultimate king. And all other individuals who would want to exert their personal rights to rule must always subjugate their will to his will. And, and that's why we pray. And when we, do, when we pray rightly, we pray, Father, according to your will. Because God's will dominates my personal agenda. Always has, always will. And the, the successful praying is when I, through time and maturity, begin to have a sense of what God's will is. And I'm able to pray God's will because I know him better. And I, I've read his book. And, and I continue to read it. And, and I'm having a sense of what is it that would please God. And then my request move from, oh, Lord, it would really enhance my ministry if I could have a 63 split window Corvette Stingray. <laughs> Two, maybe, God, could you give me wisdom to make wise decisions and so forth and all that. So as you get older, you, you begin to pray different. Well, maybe occasionally you lapse back, but that's just <laughs> on occasion. All right, let's turn the page. <clears throat> I've just simply filled in the blanks again. <clears throat> We've covered this already. The kingship actually was promised. It was promised to Abraham. Kings will come forth from you. Point two, it was promised to Jacob uh, or Israel. He had a name change. Kings will be among your descendants. It was promised to Judah, one of the 12 tribes, in Jacob's uh, prophetic blessing. By the way, in, in Genesis 49, when Jacob brings all of his sons together and, and blesses them, this is not just a, oh, son, I wish this nice thought upon you. This is a binding prophetic uh, blessing that will come true. And that's very different from maybe me trying to bless my grandsons and my granddaughter in, in some way. This is a binding, it's a formal thing that is certain and it is true. And what is certain is the scepter, the symbol of ruling authority, will not depart from one tribe. Judah is the ruling tribe, even though Judah is fourth in the birth order. And he's not of the favored wife. Uh, <clears throat> who is his mother? Leah. Yeah, he's a, he's a Leah. And so uh, here we have in Genesis 49, uh, the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from beneath, but from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come. Who does it ultimately belong to? The ultimate right to rule as a descendant of Judah. Always say Jesus. Yeah, yeah. If you're stumped for the answer, just say Jesus, and you're probably going to be right. <clears throat> now, if you have a King James or used to read King James, you might remember that prophecy until Shiloh comes. That's, uh, there's, a little bit of, there's a little bit of scholarly debate how to interpret the Hebrew at that point. I think what we have, he to whom it belongs, is a little bit better. <clears throat> Still both are referring to the, to the Messiah, the Messiah King, I like to say. But... Uh, but when he comes, the scepter, the ruling authority will be his. Now, here's the thing. When we jump to movement 10, the life of Christ, Jesus will demonstrate his authority. Uh, he will demonstrate his credentials as the Messiah King. He will present himself formally at the end of all of that time in the triumphal entry. He'll present himself formally to the nation of Israel. He'll fulfill prophecy. Behold, O Israel, your king mounted on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. All of that in the, in the Hosanna, Hosanna. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They even refer to him as their king has come. And Jesus formally presents himself as Messiah King, but he's rejected. But that rejection is in time, but it is not forever. And uh, from that rejection, 
The second, the next phase of God's redemptive program is the church. But yet we will come back, in my theology, we will come back where God will fulfill all that he promised to the nation of Israel when they are in the place of repentance, therefore blessing, not in the place of rebellion and still in the woodshed. <clears throat> so Jesus will reign, which fulfills the, the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7, it fulfills the Davidic covenant promise that a descendant of King David would rule over the throne forever. And only Jesus can rightfully fulfill that. Potentially, any of those Davidic kings could have been the Messiah in, in the sense of the expected one to rule, but they all failed. Each and every one failed. Jesus will not fail. And nor did he fail when he presented himself. Uh, to the nation. That's more than you wanted. Uh, that's, a, that's a rabbit chase. <clears throat> it was, uh, this kingship was also uh, promised to all the Israelites uh, through the words of Moses. <clears throat> Down in verse 17. And uh, Moses also said, put some restrictions on the king who would rule. Of course, he's not going to rule just any way he wants to. There are restrictions, not acquiring horses. In other words, uh, building up his military. Uh, things about taking multiple wives, which was more than just, uh, I want to have more wives and maybe more children. But the idea was you, you created alliances and you would marry uh, a daughter or something of a king you're making an alliance with. <clears throat> All of those things. So let's turn the page. This, uh, we're talking about the kingship in the Israelites. It was promised, but also it was needed. And four times in the book of Judges, that period preceding the kingship, four times the writer in Judges says, in those days Israel had no king. In those days Israel had no king. In those days Israel had no king. And, and the idea that we are to get from Judges, from the book of Judges is, they're in a time of apostasy. They don't have a godly king to lead them. They are in great need of a king, but they need a king of God's choosing, of God's specifications, not a king of their desire. Because their desire is, we want a king who will go out to battle for us, who, who will take care of us. And, and basically, the people are not as much interested in the theomonarchy as just a pure monarchy. So, <clears throat> at the bottom of page 35, that last paragraph, it would seem that Israel wanted a monarchy of their choosing, not a monarchy of God's choosing. See, the principle here, the enduring question of life is who has the right to rule? And the answer is, God is the ultimate sovereign. He is the ultimate king. He is the ultimate sovereign over creation. He is the ultimate sovereign over his chosen people. He is the ultimate sovereign over all kings. He is the ultimate sovereign, uh, and in our day, over all humanity, and in particular, over all individuals. So the theologically generated question of your life is the answer to this question. Who has the right to rule you or me? <clears throat> I know the correct answer here. I struggle to get the correct answer sometimes here because I have my plans and my ambitions and my will. And, uh, and yet that runs counter so often to God's plan. All right, let's turn, let's turn the page and get into our, our story on Samuel. Finish up, Samuel. <clears throat> and we'll get right into uh, Saul. <clears throat> You'll notice <clears throat> 1 Samuel 3, 19 to 21 at the top of the page. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and the Lord let none of his words fall to the ground. By the way, that's archery imagery. Uh, an archer shoots to a target, and if he falls short and misses the target, the arrow hits the ground. And the idea is... For, for Samuel, his words always hit the mark, uh, the target, always hit the mark. And, uh, and therefore, uh, none of his words failed. But you link that to his, the fact that he was attested as a prophet. It meant he prophesied purely and, and accurately 
all of his life, which biblical prophets had to have 100% accuracy or they were under rights to be stoned. Uh, if you did 99 right, one wrong, too bad. We don't grade on a curve. It's pass-fail. And so consequently, uh, we have seen in the past that he was uh, a prophet. We also will notice that he's a judge and a priest. Uh, the middle of the page there, we have the general nature of Samuel's ministry. Uh, after the biblical passage, we have the ABC. Note his role as judge. Note his role as priest. Note his role as prophet. And in that, he becomes a type of Christ. In that Christ will be, <coughs> or is, a judge yet to come. Christ is our great high priest, book of Hebrews. Christ is the prophet, prophesied, spoken of, all the way back by Moses in Deuteronomy 18, and uh, considered to be a prophet. Uh, uh, one of the distinctives of the ministry of the life of Christ is his discourses. And, and prophets were not only predictors of the future, they were preachers of righteousness. And Jesus was a magnificent preacher of righteousness. And all that he preached, <clears throat> his words were backed up by his works, the miracles that he performed, that he was an authoritative figure from God with a word for it, from God. So Jonah was out. Say again? You said so Jonah was out because you said they either did it exactly as God said or they were out. Yeah. Uh, no, not what they not what they actually did. Jonah would be a reluctant prophet uh, in the sense that he was called to a task and he ran the other way. But if, uh, if you'll read uh, the, the, the book of Jonah very carefully, the only thing Jonah prophesied was a, a message of doom to the Israelites, or not to the, to the Ninevites. And, uh, and God graciously relented, it says in the text, from the judgment that he had uh, planned for Nineveh. In other words, there is a principle that, that, uh, that uh, if man changes in his disposition before God, God can change in his disposition towards man. But, but I saw in that Bible project, mm -hmm. Jonah prophesied to Jeroboam II, the and then Amos came along and contradicted Jonah's prophecy. Now say that again. So, in, in the Bible project, the yeah, 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 yeah. said that Jonah prophesied to Jeroboam the second, and then Amos came along and contradicted Jonah. No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't Jonah. Me. Well, Amos prophesied that Nineveh would be destroyed. Yes, yes. It was yes. ultimately later on. Yes. Like hundred and something years later. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I go back to the uh, the standard which is given in the text that that uh, that the way you test the legitimacy of a prophet is whether or not his prophecy comes true. Now, in using Jonah as a test case, it, Jonah's faithfulness to finally preach uh, repent or judgment coming. If the people then repented, then God is free within himself to, to uh, change according to man's change. Uh, we, have this, we have this strange phraseology, even in the book of Genesis, that God repented of the evil that he had planned. Does God repent? Well, the idea is God, God changes not his essence or his attributes or his character or even his divine plan, but God changes uh, a, a, a near uh, proposed action as a result of man's change. And so, uh, so I, I don't, I think, I, I think as Jim's saying that is that uh, I don't think those two prophets are colliding and, and one is, is right and wrong. Didn't really explain it, just make yeah, yeah. Those are cool little things, uh, and they're mostly correct. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right, <clears throat> we've had the request as a, for a king. Bottom of uh, page thirty-six, point number two. Let's turn the page. <clears throat> the response to the request: We want a king like all the other nations have a king. <clears throat> Samuel who, who is, has a sensitive spiritual heart, 
Uh, Samuel is displeased, 1 Samuel 8, 6. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. Because Samuel, with insight, recognizes is they are rejecting theocracy, God rule, through chosen administrators, and <clears throat> they are wanting to establish monarchy, a king to rule over us like all the other nations have kings. Not a theomonarchy where God chooses the king and then the king is responsible to God. And so this displeases Samuel as it should have as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord responded in verse 7, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you, Samuel, that has been rejected. Ultimately, they're rejecting me as their theocratic king. So we're, we're going to move from theocracy now. Uh, they've rejected me. And they've been doing that ever since I took them out of Egypt. Uh, you know, they, you got your ten murmurings and grumblings out in the wilderness. It's just amazing. He said in verse 9, now listen to them, but, always look for those contrasted conjunctions, but warn them carefully, no, nope. warn them solemnly, big deal. Let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Okay, you want a king like all the other nations? Yeah, you got it. And now, Samuel, tell them what that's going to be like. And uh, the descriptions of the consequences of that request are given on the next page. And there's an extensive paragraph there, of, of, or a biblical passage there, 1 Samuel 8, 10 to 18. This is top of 38. Verse 11 this is what the, the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. And we don't have time to go through the whole text, but just look uh, beneath the passage. I said, note the consequences to come. Basically three generally. You're going to have a military draft at the king's initiation and pleasure. You're going to have seizure of property. If he wants it, he'll take it. And you're going to have extreme taxation. So you want a king? You got a king. Here's what you get. I want to say it reminds me of American politics, but I'm, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> All right, number four, the renewed request. But the people refuse to listen to Samuel. Do we, have a, do we have a barometer now of the spiritual maturity of the nation? Yeah, They're, they know what they want. Uh, they know, uh, but they don't know what they need. And that's a big problem for most folks. No, they said, we want a king over us stomp our foot and uh, pout. Then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now look at the bottom of the very of the page, that small a. A king over us, what are they saying? We reject, Samuel, your sons because your sons are as bad as Eli's sons. And so it's not working for us as having judges or theocratic leaders over us. That's not working. So we reject. We want a king over us. Uh, we don't like this theocracy idea. Turn the page. We want a king <clears throat> like all the other nations. Uh, this, uh, this is rejecting the Lord as the king of Israel. He said, we want a monarch. We want a monarch. We want a king to lead us. We don't want the Lord's leadership. And with that, the Lord's provision, we want a king to fight our battles. In other words, we'll trust our king for our protection and safety and security. We're not going to trust the Lord for our safety and protection and security. So, the next biblical text, the request is granted for Samuel 8, 21. And Samuel heard all that the people said. He repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, <coughs> Listen to them, give them a king. Uh, there are two kinds of will, or at least two aspects of God's will. There is the decretive will of God, and there is the permissive will of God. The decretive will of God is when God decrees something and it, it happens as he decrees it. Let there be light. There was light. That's the decreed will of God. The permissive will of God is, I desire, but I will not enforce. Eve, Adam, you can eat of any tree in the garden, but there's one tree I'm asking you 
I'm telling you, don't eat from that tree. Uh, permissively, I will allow you to make your own decision and eat the fruit of that tree. I won't decree it. You can't eat it. In other words, I decree you cannot eat that. And, and like robots, they forever after can make no moral responsible choice. No, they, that's the permissive will of God. God permissively allows mankind to fall. Now, he didn't decree their fall in, in the sense that he decreed creation, but he permissively allows it. There are times when God, like in this case here, is it is not my perfectly desired will that they would have a king of their choosing, but listen to them. We're going to let them have. I am permissively allowing them to do this, and it's going to come back on them. But we'll see it unfold. <clears throat> then Samuel said to the Israelites, Done. Everybody back to your hometown. Enough whining. That's embedded in the Hebrew. Enough whining. <laughs> now, there is an insight in the middle of the page. I'll let you read that later. But it just shows the intertwining of Samuel and Saul. And then also uh, David, because Saul will anoint David as the next king. So I just gave you some examples of how their lives are intertwining together. <clears throat> At the bottom of the page, of page 39, and also the top of page <clears throat> 40, we have the two records of the death of Samuel. And that then leads us to Saul, our first king. And when we come to Saul, there's a diagram in the middle of page 40. Uh, I really would beg you to soak this diagram up because I think this describes the three movements in the life of Saul. Early promise, middle decline, final failure. In other words, he starts out kingly and wonderfully, but he's going to end up terribly, taking his own life. And so uh, this chart, if you will, <clears throat> gives us the uh, three movements in his life. So let's begin our biblical development. Let's look at the early promise that King Saul looks good. He's looking really good. Stage one. 1 Samuel 9, there was a Benjamite, a man of standing. In other words, uh, that could mean a man of strength, wealth, might, uh, even you could even say regal bearing, uh, an outstanding man. Maybe today we would say, that guy has charisma. And that's somewhat this guy. This is a man's man, so to speak. He's a man of standing. Uh, they give a little bit of his, his background, who he, he's the son of and so forth. <clears throat> he's described in verse 2 as, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. Um, NIV 84. This is the NIV 20, 2011. But in the 84 uh, version, which I use, which is this my Bible, he, he calls him an impressive man without equal. And I think that's maybe a little better the idea. He's not only a man of standing, but he's impressive. He, he stands uh, above everyone else. Physically, he stands taller than everyone else. But he's more impressive than your average guy. Uh, he's a man, uh, as I write, head taller than most men, a man of strength and natural distinction. He appears in the narrative of Israel's first king to be all that the people might wish for. When the people say, we want a king, one that we want, uh, the kind that we want, like all the other nations have, and you trot out uh, Saul and, and other candidates, oh, that's the kind of guy we want. And, and it all looks really, really good. He's a man of stature or height or strength. Uh, 1 Samuel 10, 23. Verse 23 is described as a head taller than everyone else. Verse 24, Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? He's permissively allowed you to have. There is no one like him among all the people. And the people shouted, Long live the king. That's where the phrase comes from. You see in like European history and monarchs. <clears throat> We also notice he's a man initially of humility. Now, the Saul you think of is probably, you would never have described him as a humble person. But he was initially in the beginning. Uh, uh, he first meets Samuel uh, because Saul and one of his servants have been out looking for lost donkeys. And uh, <clears throat> they, they found out that 
there was a seer, uh, a prophet by the name of Samuel, that could tell them maybe perhaps where their donkeys were. They were seeking him out. And so the, we pick up the biblical story in 1 Samuel 9, <clears throat> verse 14. They went up to the town. As they were entering, there was Samuel coming on his, uh, toward them on his way to the high place where Samuel would probably have an altar and would worship, uh, even perhaps an altar, altar sacrifice. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord revealed this to Samuel. He says, tomorrow I'm going to send you the man. And so when Samuel, verse 17, saw sight of Saul, the Lord said, that's the man. Here he is. Now, later when Samuel begins to reveal that Saul will be the leader, the young Benjamite Saul, what's his response? Yeah, it's about time somebody recognized that I'm destined for greatness. No, he said, me? Look at the next page, top of page uh, 42. Saul answered, but am I not a Benjamite? The tribe of Benjamin <clears throat> had been almost wiped out, almost decimated. The story is in the book of Judges. And uh, so they were small. Uh, they were least in uh, reputation or importance. And, and, and Saul very humbly says so. I'm a Benjamite from the smallest tribe. Is not my clan the least of all the clans of the least of the tribes? Why do you say such a thing to me? I'm not that, I'm not that kind of person. He also, uh, in his initial, he, uh, he was a man anointed uh, to the kingship. And uh, Samuel will be the agent as the prophet priest. He will anoint Saul as the future king. Uh, to anoint with oil was a physical act of consecration to special service. So you anoint with oil kings and commission them to the special task for which they have been called. And so Samuel took a flask of olive oil, poured it on Saul's head, and kissed him, and saying, Has not the Lord appointed you ruler over his inheritance? Now, if you read the full stories and all that, you'll realize after a while, Samuel really had a soft spot in his heart for Saul. But he would get angry with Saul because of Saul's disobedience to the Lord. But when it, was, when it came down to it and it was time to displace Saul, Samuel would weep over him because he loved him so. Get a little taste of that, even though it may have been a cultural kissing, uh, you know, uh, as a greeting type thing. I think there's more in the text because the other things that I read about it is that there's, there's a genuine affection here for him. So his formal anointing, will come later, but this is the uh, initial anointing with oil. It's kind of a preview to the formal, which will come later. Also, we see that uh, Saul is a man of Holy Spirit enabling. And this is where theologians, Old Testament theologians, really begin to scratch their heads because there's a big question here and everybody's got an opinion, but nobody knows. Except me. No, I, <laughs> even I don't. First Samuel 10, verse 5. Uh, he tells, uh, uh, Samuel tells uh, uh, Saul that you're going to meet some prophets and the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully on you. Now remember, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would uh, come upon individuals to equip them for a special task. Uh, we see in the building of the tabernacle that the Holy Spirit would come upon artisans and craftsmen in order that they might have the skills necessary to create the, uh, the, the tabernacle. We see the Holy Spirit coming upon individuals, uh, like in the book of Judges, to enable them to fulfill a task God had called them to. Even someone as raunchy and, and lusty as, uh, as uh, Samson, the Spirit comes upon him. Uh, to to in equip and enable him. Well, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon Saul. Who among all the Israelites needs special anointing power in order to fulfill the task of being king of the nation? I mean, the kings need the anointing or the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so Samuel says, the Holy Spirit is going to come powerfully on you and you will be changed into a different person. Hmm. 
was set, was that referring to, and you will become, by Old Testament definition, you will become a believer. Was Saul a believer, or uh, uh, though a weak one, or was Saul not a believer? And that's where the theologians argue. <clears throat> when it says changed into a different person, uh, does it mean he was converted in Old Testament language? Or does it mean that he gained a kingly, godly, spiritual perspective on how he was to rule? And so the tip off, the ball's in the air, and I don't know who controls. So we'll, re we'll move on. Any, anybody have any thoughts? What, what's your general thought? What do you know about Saul? Do you think he was a believer? Or do you think uh, he was not a believer? <clears throat> That's what I thought. Nobody's going to stand out there and say, I believe it. I won't, so I won't let... Well, it's I, hard I'm, to believe that he was a believer the way he treated David. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, good point. And also he consulted media. Went to the Witch of Endor. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the only disturbing thing is the text says he was changed into a different person. Yeah. Which... Uh, is it possible? Is it possible that a person can legitimately come to faith and not spiritually grow as much as we would expect and hope for, and yet they're still considered a believer at the end? Yes. And then suddenly you you start mixing in. Well, wait a minute. Am I an Arminian or am I a Calvinist? And and is I, do I believe in eternal security or can you lose your salvation? Maybe he was saved, but then he got lost. You got a whole lot of theology comes to play on this one guy Saul, and we're just reading his story. And then the evil spirit comes into him, and that's a evil word. spirit comes upon him. So yeah, so you know you you you've got your arguments, pros and cons, and you've got your theologians that champion one side or the other. I've been studying this for decades, and here's my answer: I do not know. I do not know. I guess it's ba it's based on the. Uh, based on the day of the week, maybe. All right, let's turn the page. It does say he prophesied. It's hard to contradict. Well, that's another good argument for changing a different person. In fact, if you, if you and I've done this, I, I don't have it with me, but I've given the best, you know, pros and cons on his conversion. And you can, and there are several things you can list on either side of it. Uh, yeah, some things in the Bible, the Bible clearly says what it says. And uh, there are some things that I guess we have to leave in the form of mystery. Maybe it's a mystery. Or maybe, maybe later you and I will develop stronger convictions. But as of today, I have an opinion, but I have no strong conviction <coughs> on Saul. <coughs> It's interesting that my Bible commentary skips from 10.5 to 10.7. It doesn't even address 10.6. So whoever wrote the commentary doesn't know either. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that's a good move. I should have probably done the same. All right. Top of page 43. He still, we're in this, uh, <clears throat> we're in this initial, this initial stage where he's holding out early promise, uh, he is a man of early discretion. Uh, <coughs> Saul went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts he, uh, God had touched. But notice verse 27. But some scoundrels said, how can this fellow save us? And they despised him and brought him no gifts. But what does the text say? Saul kept silent. <clears throat> so there's 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 an initial discretion. We, he's not going to have this later on. He, whatever he's got here now in the early stages, he will lose that discretion later on. Uh, if he senses a threat to his throne, he'll try to spear him to the wall, King David. Uh, but now in the early promise, he's looking good. He's a man of courage. Uh, his first military challenge was attacking the Ammonites, and he was successful in that. Uh, in fact, uh, it's described for us uh, in uh, 1 Samuel 11, <clears throat> 1 to 3. I kind of like this story because 
Well, let's just read it. Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Gabesh uh, Gilead, which is on the east side of the Jordan River or northeast side of the Jordan River. <clears throat> and all the men of Jabesh said, make a treaty with us, king, and uh, we'll be subject to you. We just don't want to fight. Just make a treaty with us. Nahash says, oh, yeah, I'll make a treaty with you, only under one condition, that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you, every one of the men. Why would he say that? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> for one thing, uh, to lose an eye is going to limit you as a warrior. Uh, depth perception, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things. So that would do that. Having one eye still allows you to be a servant. You can work the fields. You can. You, there are certain things you can do uh, in the community that you just won't be a very accomplished fighter. And so uh, uh, Nahash realizes is is that if they'll allow me to gouge out their eye, I can control them. But also, I have less fear that they'll rise up in rebellion against me because they're going to have a hard time with the one-eye situation. <clears throat> and then uh, <coughs> another thing is, I, I just want to humiliate you and subjugate you, so I'll just do this. So the elders of Jabesh said, would you give us seven days to think it over? <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, let's turn the page. <clears throat> At the bottom, page, uh, the text, 1 Samuel 11, verse 4. When the messengers came <clears throat> to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then, Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen. Now, he's the, he's the king, and he's working his fields. Because as, yet, as of yet, he has no prophetic word from the Lord, uh, through Samuel as to what he's supposed to do. His first act is not to go out and find, build him a palace or something like that. He's gone back to his family and he's doing his work. Uh, this, is, this is a guy that's probably pretty wealthy because of the description of, of the, pro, uh, uh, not protos, but the description of the wealth that he has and the donkeys and so forth. And he could have had a servant out there plowing, but he's, you know, he's a man's man. He's out there doing his work. And so uh, he says, what's wrong with everyone? Why are they weeping? And they repeated what the men of Jabesh said. When Saul heard their words, notice this, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him. Why does the Holy Spirit come upon people in the Old Testament? To equip them and, and empower them for a task that God places, will place before them, which will be the deliverance of the people of Jabesh Gilead. And so the Spirit came powerfully upon him, and he burned with anger. So what does he do? He took a pair of oxen, I guess an extra pair of oxen, and cut them into pieces and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel. Now you might recall in the book of Judges, they cut up a prostitute, a woman, and sent her pieces to all the tribes to assemble the nation. It was a solemn way of saying, you better come. It would get your attention if you got a piece of meat in the mail and, and, and a summons to come it was somewhat of a warning. This is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Got it. I'll be there. <clears throat> when Saul mustered the people at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000 and those of Judah 30,000. Now you might recall that the word thousand in Hebrew is Eleph. And Eleph means a thousand. Sometimes it means unit of unspecified number. So it's either literal 300,000 or it's 300 military units. It doesn't affect the biblical principles and all that. It's just we have sometimes a hard time understanding uh, biblical numbers. And so when in doubt, just let the text say what it says. But what it says is 300 elephs, whatever an elephant is. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, and, and again, I, I, one of my professors said in this case, he tends to think it's literal 1,000. <clears throat> so there are 300 literal 1,000 soldiers and of Judah 30,000. Point A, Saul was working in the fields when he heard the news. <clears throat> Point B, the Spirit of God came upon him. Point three, uh, C, he impressed upon the other tribes. You better muster with me. 
And uh, now we come to the bottom of the page. The men of Jabesh are ready to reply to after the seven days. <clears throat> Top of page 46. This is what they said to the Ammonites. Uh, Tomorrow we'll surrender to you, and you can do whatever you like. Because they know help's on the way. And so uh, they, you know, give their response. And uh, then the next, we see the success of Saul in battle, uh, the aftermath. No one's going to be put to death today, <clears throat> for the Lord has rescued Israel. And uh, at the bottom of the page, we have that First Samuel 11 passage. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king. Hebrew word there is Melech. The first time it was, uh, what is the Hebrew word for prince? Uh, Nagib. This, now it's uh, Melech. And so this is the formal kingship commissioning. And there they sacrificed fellowship offerings to the Lord, and uh, Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. <clears throat> One of the most remarkable men I ever met in my life was uh, an Englishman by the name of J. Sidlow Baxter. He wrote this uh, six-volume Explore the Book, uh, later put into one volume. And within that volume, he has a quote on Saul that I think is terrific, top of page 47. This was the Saul, young Saul of fair promise, extraordinarily rich in natural endowments and specially equipped by supernatural conferments. The future seemed bright indeed. His call to the kingship was an opportunity in a million coming to a man in a million. He was called to the kingship, and he was constitutionally kingly. He betrayed none of the symptoms of vainglory, which others less gifted than himself have betrayed when suddenly elevated. If we could just leave the story of Saul here, he would be one of our heroes of the faith. But we can't leave him here. And it is illustrating, it's building a principle that it's not how you start. It's how you finish. And that's the great challenge of the Christian life. It's not how you start, but how you finish. <clears throat> now, we said there are three stages, early promise, and now we're in our middle decline. <clears throat> I won't go through all the stories. I encourage you to go back and just read the summary notes that I have. But <clears throat> the middle decline begins, uh, first of all, with a foolish sacrifice that Saul is going to make. Um, he has he has been anointed as the first king it is clear that he is to obey the Lord and so forth and uh, when the Lord speaks he is to, to, to do whatever the Lord commands now turn the page to 48 at the top <clears throat> but along comes our first challenge the, the burr in our saddle during this period of Israelite history is the Philistines, our Philistines. Um, in 1 Samuel 13, verse 5, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They were the sea peoples. Uh, they were probably, their origin is probably possibly Cyprus, possibly European. They brought in uh, metalwork, uh, iron, and all that. They were much advanced in, in Im implements of war initially. Everybody caught up with them, but initially. So they were, they were formidable, and for a couple, 125, 150 years, they were a real, a real burr. Uh, they went up and camped at Michmash. Verse 6, when the Israelites saw the situation was critical, their army was hard-pressed, they hid. Uh, Saul remained at Gilgal. All the troops were quaking with fear. <clears throat> now, what happens? Samuel had told him, wait for me. In seven days, I'll be there. And uh, then I will inquire of the Lord what we're to do. We'll get our battle plan. We'll get the Lord's blessing. Then we'll move forward. But you wait for me seven days. What does Saul do? He does not. He waits seven days. But when Samuel doesn't arrive, when he expects him, he says, well, then I'll just offer the sacrifice. Uh-uh. He is not of the tribe of Levi. He, he is not permitted 
uh, to make a, a, a sacrificial offering. And even as king, if he were able to do so, he was specifically commanded, wait and don't do anything until the prophet of God arrives. And so basically, at the, the last paragraph on the bottom of page 48, Saul's sacrifice was blameworthy for at least two reasons. He's offering a sacrifice that would be normally given by, by a priest, and he is not a priest. And secondly, the sacrifice is clear disobedience to the Lord's prophet. Theomonarchy works when the monarch is under Theo, under God. God tells the rules through the king. The king doesn't rule independently of God. And so what is happening here is Saul is working outside, if you will, the chain of command. He's, he's ignored Samuel, the prophet of the Lord. Therefore, he's ignored God, and he's been disobedient, and he's taking on the privilege that he doesn't have. Turn the page. <clears throat> Here's the rebuke. Top of the page, 1 Samuel 13, verse 11. What have you done? Asked Samuel. Saul replied, well, when I saw that the men were scattering and you didn't come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at Micmac, well, I thought to myself, now the Philistines will come against me at Gilgal and I haven't sought the Lord's favor, <clears throat> so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Okay? You've done a foolish thing. You fool. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. If you had kept that command, he would have established your kingdom without end. There would have been a Saulite dynasty and maybe then a Saulite covenant. But no, you have proven to be unworthy. But now, verse 14, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out, what does the phrase say? A man after God's own heart. Have you ever heard David, a man after God's own? And you and you look and look and look to see where in the world in the life of David was that? It was actually said to, to Saul, but it's referring to David. That David, the David's best uh, quality was his heart for God. And when he misplaced his heart, he knew where to come back and get it. Saul is going to lose his heart for God and he will never replace it. Which causes us to wonder, was he ever a believer to begin with? Maybe so, maybe not. But now you're going to lose your kingdom. God will appoint someone else, <clears throat> and so forth. Now, let's turn the page. <coughs> We've seen his foolish sacrifice. He also did a rash vow. Let me just summarize this whole story. Uh, once again, they are facing an invading army. <clears throat> and, uh, and Jonathan and uh, his servant kind of do a little recon mission. They kill about 20 of the enemy, and they come back, <clears throat> and the enemy gets demoralized. And that's where 1 Samuel 14, 15 come, enters into it. The panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field, those in the outposts and raiding parties. And then not only that, the ground shook. In other words, there was an earthquake in God's timing and God's choosing. And this earthquake caused further panic within the camp. And so uh, uh, <clears throat> Saul uh, assembled uh, all of his men for battle. He sees the Philistines in confusion. And then he chases in after them, and they start pursuing the Philistines. The Philistines have chosen to attack on the on the east side of, of the of near the Jordan River. They were located; their homes were on the west side near the ocean, and so they are routed and they're running. And Saul wants to wants to rout them completely, and so he wants his soldiers to follow them quickly and right behind them and destroy them. And so what he does is he issues this rash vow. I don't want one of my soldiers to stop and get food, replenish his strength. I want you to pursue the enemy to the very end. And Saul's army is absolutely 
famished. They are weak. They're pursuing the enemy. They've routed the enemy. But, it, but it's very hard for these uh, weakened soldiers to finish the job against the Philistines. And uh, Jonathan, who did not hear the vow, that anybody who does that will be put to death. Any Israelite soldier that stops and eats and regains his strength will be put to death. Saul thinks it's an urgent matter. We, we got the bull by the horns. Let's, let's finish this job. And so he issues this rash vow. The problem is Jonathan sees some honey, wild honey, gets that sugar kick, takes some of that honey and puts it out. And his, the text says his eyes brightened, regained his strength, got a sugar high, and uh, <clears throat> they went on and finished it. Then later they discover someone has, someone has broken the vow. They cast lots, the Thummin and Thummin, uh, Urim and Thummin, uh, which was their way of dis discerning the will of God on certain occasions. And it fell upon Jonathan. And then Saul says, I'm sorry, Jonathan, my son, you'll have to die. And the soldiers say, what? Are you kidding me? No, he's not going to die. He's part of the reason why we had the, had the victory and so forth. And so <clears throat> they prevented Saul from following up on a rash vow. Does that sound like the kind of king you would want to follow? Uh, so uh, let's skip over to uh, page 52. I tried to summarize that. And I just, and now, since we've run out of time, give me three minutes, and I'll just try to hit the, hit the high peaks here. Uh, here's another thing. In his middle decline, he's had that foolish sacrifice, the rash vow, and then against the Amalekites, the Amalekites were put under the harem ban. The harem ban is what, what uh, uh, Jericho and I, AI, I, were placed under. The harem ban was, means devoted to destruction. God only could place the harem ban upon uh, the, the enemies. The harem ban said everyone is devoted to destruction. God is bringing the ultimate act of harsh discipline to bear. And so <clears throat> the harem ban is placed upon the Amalekites by God. And uh, Saul it's supposed to kill the kings and the people, kill the animals. I mean, they don't take spoils of war or anything. But what does Saul do? Well, he spares the kings. He takes the choice livestock. And Samuel shows up. And <clears throat> when Samuel shows up, <clears throat> what does Samuel do? He says, <clears throat> what's this I hear? I think I hear the bleeding of sheep and, and so forth. What have you done? And the truth comes out that he was he was uh, dis he was disobedient. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's let me see. Yeah, turn to page fifty-five, middle of page fifty-five, where it says the confrontation. First Samuel fifteen fourteen. But Samuel said, "What then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears? What's that lowing of cattle I hear?" Saul answered, "Well, the soldiers." brought them from the Amalekites and spared the best of the sheep and cattle as a sacrifice of the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Yeah, right. You got caught. <clears throat> and you couldn't deny it <coughs> because you got caught red-handed. And so he blamed his soldiers. And then he said, oh, and I was going to offer as a spiritual sacrifice the animals that should have been killed in the harem ban destruction. Samuel is not going to hear it. And uh, at the top of page 56, one of the most quoted passages in the Old Testament. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Here it is. To obey is better than to sacrifice. Obedience trumps ritual observance. Because, and the fact of the matter is, we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do both: obey and sacrifice. <clears throat> if you want to play the premium, obedience is better than <clears throat> sacrifice. Well, we also have on that same page, middle of the page, uh, not only the partial obedience in the harem ban, we have the jealousy with David 
Uh, I gave you several reasons, starting on the top of page 57. Uh, Saul hears the people praising David in song. Uh, he throws a spear at David once while David was playing the harp. He sends David out to command soldiers, hoping he'll die in battle. He plots to kill David. That's the next page. He searches to try to kill David and so forth. Uh, all of this, we're in the middle of decline, and we're declining rapidly. In fact, uh, if you read Saul's uh, life with, a psychological, with psychological insight, this is a man who is deteriorating mentally and psychologically. He is breaking down. And then his final failure, he's going to consult the witch of Endor uh, when he is commanded that no one is to seek out a medium or a witch. And he also, at the end of his life, he's wounded and he takes his own life. And thus ends the uh, rise and fall of the first king of Israel. I have some uh, takeaways that are pretty straightforward. And uh, I thank you for your graciousness in uh, letting me take a few extra minutes. Lord, dismiss us now with a sense of your presence and uh, of your power and your strength. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, folks. <clears throat> Next time, David, part one. Thank <laughs> you.